Hello, I'm Michael Kopinski, the Director of Research at Noble Capital Markets. This program is about global trading and how a couple of developments a few years ago have significantly and positively influenced this company still today. We'll be featuring the management of Great Lakes Dredge and Dock. The stock symbol is GLDD. The company has a market cap of about 615 million. In this program, we would like to uncover questions like, how did lifting the US oil export ban three years ago affect a dredging company? And why are the US East Coast ports dredging due to the expansion of the Panama Canal, which happened years ago? We're fortunate at Noble to have an expert, transportation and logistics analyst, Poe Fratt, a best on the street, all-star analyst is surveyed by the Wall Street Journal. He will be interviewing Lassa Peterson, the president and CEO, and Mark Marinko, the CFO of Great Lakes Dredge and Dock Corporation. And before I turn it over to Poe, I encourage you to stick around for closing comments when Poe and I will discuss the key takeaways from this interview. Thank you, Lassa, and thank you, Mark, for joining us uh, on this video meeting. Um, why don't we start off by asking you to describe the different types of dredging projects that you work on? Yeah, well, thank you for having us. Uh, the different types of uh, dredging projects that we have, we divided into, first of all, capital markets, which is, is about 42% of the work that we do. Uh, and that includes the large portions of the port deepening and port expansion projects. Um, as you know, on the East Coast uh, and also in the Gulf, uh, the post-Panama uh, expansion vessels uh, are now opening up new trade routes and that lets uh, large container vessels go in on the East Coast and also large LNG and uh, crude export um, uh, vessels go through the Panama Canal. So this uh, requires then deepening of the, the channels and the ports. So we're going now down to, on some ports, all the way down to 53 feet. Also included in the capital projects, are uh, what we call coastal restoration, land reclamation, and excavation of underwater trenches. The second part of what we do is coastal protection projects, which accounts for about 25% of our revenues. And that is includes creating and rebuilding beaches after winter storms. And uh, as we see climate change happening, uh, these uh, projects are becoming larger and more frequent. Uh, so it, it's a very interesting and growing part of our, our market. And thirdly, we what we call maintenance projects that accounts for about 15% of the revenue. And that is maintaining the shipping channels uh, and maintaining the waterways depth uh, into the harbors uh, throughout the country. Um, this is a reoccurring revenue stream that we, we have. And it, a good example of that is the Baltimore Harbor, which is being maintained every year. In addition to the above, we, we do have uh, quite a lot, a lot of work internationally, historically, uh, but uh, that market has been uh, soft the last uh, years and uh, resulting in a reduction in the international revenues. Great. Would you, would you walk us through how you analyze projects and then draft your, the, the bids? And are there standard terms that are mandated by, you know, your customers? You know, I, I think the largest customer is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer. Yeah, we can do that. I, I think I'll let Mark uh, do that presentation. Sure, sure. Thanks, Lassa. Um, you're correct, Bo. Uh, our largest customer is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They're about 80 to 85 percent of our revenue because they're responsible for all the navigable waterways in the US. And there's really two types of bids that happen through the Army Corps. Number one is we call it a rip and read. It's essentially the largest percentage of uh, the type of bids that come out. And what that means is you um, bid, it's a fixed price bid and it's submitted. And within 15 minutes, you find out who's won the uh, the project, its lowest price wins, but you also have to, as a parameter, you have to, the government has an estimate, you have to be below the government estimate plus 
So that's a, a large percentage of the number of bids. But second type of bid is what we would be a standard type of RFP bid. So uh, it's not a large percentage of the bids, but the, the contracts that have RFP are generally very large contracts in terms of a dollar amount. So uh, you submit your bid and you don't get an answer right away, like I, I mentioned in the um, uh, rip and read, but you do um, find out about 30 to 90 days later, it is not necessarily low price wins. They take into account your performance history, your safety record, the type of vessel you're going to use, and your type and methods and means to complete that project. That's great. So once you're awarded the project, how do you manage um, each project? And you know, what type of controls do you try to put in place to, to manage risk and you know, avoid the, the potential surprises? Yeah, I think starting out with our people, and uh, the company has been in business for over 130 years. And uh, the, our personnel, our senior personnel who's involved in product management and uh, estimating has been with the company for 30 to 40 years typically. So we have a large database of information on each port, each shipping channel, each beach uh, uh, that we worked on in, in our history. And that forms the basis for our bids. So the, the data on how we have performed prior and uh, looking at new soil conditions, uh, we do have uh, changing weather patterns, but all this is gathered in a database and we use that when we're bidding the work. Once we're starting to mobilize, uh, we have uh, systems and procedures in place so that we are standardizing our product execution methodology and our personnel is trained on these procedures uh, throughout their career to make sure that we can execute the work safely and complete them on schedule and below the cost that we have bid. Um, I think that's the most important part of managing the risk that we are seeing on our projects. Great. Mark, Mark, you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah, one just additional piece there. As Lassa mentioned, all the historical information we have. So many of these projects, we've worked in the exact same area before. So we know the soil conditions. We know the weather history, what times of year, the, the weather pattern. So we take, because it is a fixed price bid, we do take into account in our estimates downtime for weather delays based on the history and experience we know and time of year makes a difference, as well as downtime for maintenance. So we put those uh, factors into our bid to protect us because it is a fixed price bid. Okay, you know, when we look at you know the time we're going through with COVID-19, you know, it's somewhat unprecedented, but how, how are you managing your personnel? Any changes in how you manage either your offshore personnel or your onshore personnel? Uh, not really changes, but uh, we have in place um, a system we call injury and incident free. And it's a culture that has been developed in the company over the last 10 years. Uh, we've been driving down uh, and improving our safety records uh, for these years. Uh, and this was has now become an integral part of how we execute our work. So when COVID-19 uh, happened, uh, we were able to adopt, build on the culture and adopt our procedures to this new situation. So we were uh, looking at our vessels primarily to make sure that we could keep working on our projects and we were designated uh, part of a critical infrastructure uh, for the whole nation and as such we could continue working. We isolated each vessel and looked at uh, the personnel on board made sure that the contacts between the crew and the outside world was minimized. We had crew vessels that were going with the crew to the vessel when we had crew changes that were designated to that particular vessel. And we conducted interviews with our people who are at home to make sure that they had been socially um, uh, 
take, uh, taking care of themselves in a way so they were uh, minimizing the risk of exposure. When they were then traveling to the job site, we issued them with PPE. And when we mobilized be before going on to the dredge, we had temperature checks and we had interviews with them about their health. I think the uh, this response uh, ensured that we were able to work for the first nine weeks of the COVID uh, pandemic uh, without having any positive uh, detection of the virus in our en entire organization. Unfortunately, that, uh, that changed. Um, last Saturday, we had one positive uh, uh, COVID uh, case on a rental vessel. And we have then procedures in place to have this person isolated. Also have the personnel that was working together with this person isolated and also the vessels uh, disinfected. Uh, hopefully this uh, situation is now contained. Uh, the vessel is up and running again, and uh, our dredge is up and running again and working. Okay, uh, Brent, you talked about, you know, two of the main drivers right now, which are, you know, the expansion of the pa Panama Canal and now energy, LNG exports uh, and other exports. How how good is the visibility, and what are you know really the main drivers of that visibility? Well, the main driver of the visibility is the Corps of Engineers budgets. Uh, the Corps of Engineers is eighty five percent of our revenues, and the Corps of Engineers gets a budget uh, by year by year from Congress, and their budget has been expanding every year the last three years and our bid market last year was 1.8 billion the highest we ever seen it and uh, this year it seems to be on the same scale there are also drivers in the market which uh, gives me very a good um, let's say visibility to what is going to happen for a business you are looking at climate change which uh, drives uh, looks like more intense winter storms that are then eroding the beaches that has to be rebuilt it also destroys uh, protection for wetlands uh, as we've seen in mississippi where the barrier islands are being uh, ripped in two and we are then engaged to to rebuild these barrier islands um, and wetlands uh, the same way also international shipping uh, has been increasing uh, year over year and uh, the expansion of the Panama Canal has then driven the port deepening projects in the United States and we just see this continuing going forward. Uh, Mark do you want to comment on the uh, bid market and and the backlog? Yeah the other uh, th you know those macro uh, items that lots of dispensing are really important to the visibility there's also, as you get into the, uh, the cadence of how a bid comes out, particularly from the U.S. Army Corps, these projects are planned years in advance. And there are a number of steps that occur before a project's let out for bid. So we see those steps happening. So we have very good visibility into the next 12 months as these steps occur. And then when you look at larger projects that have a really long lead time as they're planned and there's environmental planning and economic planning, um, we have a very good visibility into projects two, three, four years out when they're really large projects, in particular the port deepenings. Great. Um, you know, the industry, the dredging industry seemed to go through a lull as far as capacity additions. And, uh, but recently that's picked up and some of your competitors have added capacity. Could you highlight your growth plans or your expansion plans? Yeah, we as Great Lakes, we have added to our capacity uh, over the last two years. And so have our competitors. Um, we need to build in the US. We are a Jones Act company. So we are building at US yards. We are crewing our vessels with the US sailors. And the company is managed and owned by US citizens. 
um, over the last two years, uh, we have had a 34% increase in the dredging fleet capacity when it comes to hopper dredges. Uh, Great Lakes uh, built the Ellis Island, which is by far the largest hopper dredge in the U uh, US. And Weeks Marine, they built another hopper dredge called Magdalene. It's about half the size of Ellis Island. Um, Weeks Marine has uh, just announced uh, that they are going ahead and building a copy of the Magdalene. And we in Great Lakes, we are very optimistic that we will sign a new contract for a new dredge uh, here in second quarter. On the cutter side of the business, Weeks Marine took delivery of a large 30 inch cutter suction dredge um, last year, the JS Chattery. And also Cala Marine has built a new modern cutter dredge, which has just entered operation. But we have not rested on uh, this situation. We have brought back from the Middle East the Carolina cutter dredge last year. And right now we are unloading the Ohio cutter dredge also from the Middle East. And uh, those two dredges are among the, the most powerful cutter dredges in the United States. I should also mention that on the mechanical side, which we we call it, we have added uh, a large mechanical uh, dredge. We call it the Dredge 58, which we bought from a competitor who was not utilizing this dredge uh, much. And we have put it into very good use on the Jacksonville project uh, this year. Great. With, with good visibility, you know, expanding budgets, um, good macro drivers, I mean, what's the biggest challenge ahead then? Uh, is it regulation, uh, access to capital, or or something else that um, that you want would like to highlight? Well, I look upon it more as the biggest opportunities that we have, and that is, as we've gone, been going through our restructuring over the last three years, we now have a very strong balance sheet and a very strong cash balance, and we then have the opportunity now to both invest into our fleet, as we do with the renewal of the Hopper fleet. But we also have the opportunity to upgrade and make the existing fleet more efficient. On top of that, we can now look at uh, new markets. And I see the new developments in the offshore wind generation of the East Coast of the US as a great opportunity for us to diversify our business into a new business segment um, by slightly modifying our existing equipment and building some new equipment we can be a very active participant in this new very exciting market which uh, is uh, growing extremely fast there are plants in place for more than 15 gigawatts of new capacity over the next 10 years uh, which will require uh, new entrants such as us into that market. Our competition in that market will be the European dredging companies that have built new vessels to install the wind towers and the monopiles. And uh, today for them, offshore wind is the majority of their revenue and almost all their profits. So it's a very interesting market for us as we go forward. Just to follow up on the wind market, uh, Lassa, is is part of that going to be Jones Act, or will it be um, will it be entirely open to to foreign competition? Some of the work is definitely Jones Act um, protected, um, but uh, part of that market could also be done by international vessels. Uh, when it comes to the very large uh, lifting vessels, uh, we had assumed that there is opportunity, there's a way of using the Jones Act to get a dispensation if no vessel exists in the US that can execute the work. Um, just recently, Dominion uh, announced that they are going ahead and exploring the opportunity for building a US Jones Act compliant heavy lift uh, offshore wind installation vessel and uh, as part of that uh, we have had discussions with the 
with Dominion on participation in the projects and how we can uh, be assistance to them in their development of this uh, new exciting industry. That's great. Well, it sounds like more opportunities than challenges, which is always nice to hear. I want to thank Lasa Peterson and Mark Marenko for joining us to, uh, in this video interview and to learn more about Great Lakes Dredge and Dock. Thank you very much and have a great, a great day. Uh, thank you. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Paul. Poe, this was a very interesting presentation. I have a couple of questions. Uh, some investors may not be familiar with the Jones Act, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what that, because they made some references to the Jones Act. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what the Jones Act is. Yeah, the Jones Act is, is intended, it's legislation that intends uh, to maintain a strong uh, marine industry from a standpoint of offshore construction, um, also building, you know, marine shipyard construction. Um, it does uh, mean that any work that's done in intercoastal or intracoastal areas uh, has to have or be done by a vessel that is built in the U.S., uh, crewed in the U.S., or by U.S. citizens, and also by a company that's owned uh, by U.S. citizens. So um, those are the things that it, it, it's helpful to understand that because it does limit the amount of companies that can do work in um, offshore areas in the U.S. And Paul, they were talking about the different revenue uh, projects, uh, dredging projects that they have. And, and certainly there's certain aspects here that are very compelling given the fact that um, the Panama Canal has been expanded. Um, that we are now, as the U.S. is now exporting oil, what do you see as the biggest opportunities for this company in terms of the revenue buckets that they were uh, presenting to us? Yeah, I think overall the the revenue opportunities are pretty balanced, um, but they're very you know very high. As they highlighted, the bid market you know looks to be in the 1.8 billion dollar range. And you know that's well funded from the standpoint of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers budget and other sources of funding, and so it's pretty balanced. But I would say that you know when you look at port deepenings, uh, you've seen a lot of activity along initially along the East Coast, uh, just because that's where more container ships have have been accessing, uh, you know, or arriving from overseas markets. And now with the lifting of the oil export ban a couple of years ago, you're seeing more interest in exporting out of the U.S. and mainly the Gulf Coast. Uh, we've seen a big production increase in the U.S., mainly in Texas and Oklahoma and other areas that will likely flow out of um, those areas down to the coast, down to Corpus Christi, down to Houston, down to potentially Brownsville and be exported directly as you know refined products or crude oil and also as liquefied natural gas too gotcha well poa greatly appreciate you bringing this company to us today and we encourage your, uh, the investors to and viewers to go to channelcheck.com channel is spelled traditional way and check chek.com for more information on this company and some of other Poe's research thank you again poa you're welcome, Mike. Thank you.